Okay, so as I had uh, mentioned earlier, uh, Atkey 17 had, uh, had has suggested that when we look at monitoring of our delivery of CRT and in a particular patient and otherwise, it has to be multidimensional and uh, which would include parameters uh, like phosphate control, which was uh, discussed earlier, uh, and in terms of the hemostasis, the coagulation, control of sepsis, fluid balance, etc. Right. And most of the time we most of the time we are generally doing this and we are monit uh, monit ma monitoring the patient parameters and the lab parameters and the top half I think is taken care of most other places. But there are two other aspects of monitoring that I think should be included and I think uh, Dr. Mali's talk really, really highlighted the importance of that and that is monitoring the delivery of therapy because your whole goal should be that I, I give the best possible, I mean, in the most efficient and economical way, a therapy that will achieve my goals, which, uh, which, in, for which every patient may be different. And then, of course, we will come to the alarms. So when, when I look at monitoring delivery, I divide it into four kind of layers. One, you want to do it at a patient and a clinician level, which is going to help you at the bedside to make decisions into patient monitoring. And two, you, want, you also need to monitor your therapy because you want to look at it from a program level, like what Dr. Marley's just highlighted, that you want to look at your quality metrics. Are you delivering and doing what you're supposed to be doing or and if there are any shortfalls somewhere that need improvement. Then, of course, you would need it at a hospital level because like in the graph uh, or in the diagram shown that there are a lot of stakeholders involved in CKRT and we need to have a constant supply of resources uh, of, of, uh, of the heart hardware of the fluids that have to be available and if the hospital knows at a bigger picture what is our utilization they could probably plan their resources and budget for them appropriately and then of course at, at a national and an international level because if you do not know what you're doing there is no way we will be able to benchmark ourselves against uh, very established and mature programs that that are run by by other speakers here Right, so I think a few years ago, uh, our problem was, was this, that, that I can see that we were on manual monitoring charts and of course, transforming and, and uh, sending all this data to evaluate was going to be very, very challenging and, and it, it was very difficult. But a few years ago, our hospital, our institution decided to go paperless and transform everything onto the computer and uh, I was asked by my division chair to, to take care of the CRT part and then because this was a hospital-wise exercise, it was free of cost. We did not need to pay the IT services anything and then of course I lapped on that opportunity and uh, we, we spent almost a year with IT to come up with an in-house prescription form uh, that, that will kind of key in and gather all the parameters that we thought we would be interested to look at in terms of our uh, performance in disease. And then of course we created uh, flow sheets and for the nurses to chart in and all this data then eventually flows into a CRT chart and then we get a data summary for each patient. And if you look at this graph, we, we can actually track the whole CKRT history of this patient, what day and time did it actually start and what was the end time of this CRT, the duration of each filter run, the time between filter one and filter two, so what was the time that we, we required to, 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 to commence a new filter, um, what was the effluent dose delivered, uh, what was the, the, F, uh, the total volume of effluent, the total volume of ultrafiltration for that particular running filter, what was the rate of ultrafiltration that this patient achieved, and then and each particular row will give us the run of each filter and what was the, the, the reason why we lost that filter? Was it an elective stop? Was it interrupted because of a procedure or was it because the filter clotted? And then at the end of this, then we do generate a dashboard that helps us to answer a lot of uh, questions that, that Dr. Marlies had, had asked in terms of our average filter life, downtime. <coughs> I think, but of course, this is still a work in progress and we are still trying to, 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 to get a few things uh, sorted out. Uh, now coming to the next part, uh, the CKRT alarms. So as I've shown you earlier, this is just earlier, this is just a schematic of what uh, uh, the, the circuit looks like. So we of course have the blood component where we have an access which pulls out blood from the patient 
and then it perfuses through the filter and it is returned to the patient as in a veno venous access. And then we have a dialysate port running and then the replacement fluid which could be run pre-filter or post-filter and, and an anticoagulant which is generally run before the, bl before the uh, blood pump and before the pre-filter fluid. Now most CKRT machines, as, as you may be aware, that there are f at least four pressures that they, they monitor. So one, the first pressure is the access pressure, which is a pre-pump pressure that is monitored. And it, it depends or it tells us about the integrity of the access, uh, the, your filter, the, the access choices that we discussed. And then of course, what is the blood flow rate that you're generating through this access. The second pressure point that is usually monitored is the one between the blood pump and before the filter, which measures the, the pre-filter pressure and reflects everything that is happening from downstream, the filter and downstream up to the return line. The third pressure uh, monitored is usually monitored in the deaeration chamber, which is the return pressure. And this tells us anything downstream that happens in the, in the tubing up to the catheter and into the return. The fourth pressure is, is, is monitored in the effluent line and it tells us what is the effluent pressure which is in the, in the potential space uh, in which the fibers uh, are, are suspended. Now from these four pressures, the machine has software that it utilizes these pressures to calculate uh, the transmembrane pressure, which is a membrane uh, pressure across the membrane, uh, across the fiber of the filter and the filter pressure drop, which is the, the drop in the pressure between pre-filter to post-filter and uh, how to interpret these pressures, we will just come to that in a bit. Okay, so the, the excess, so the excess pressure is, is essentially uh, the, the, the pressure, like I mentioned, uh, that, that reflects your integrity of your vascular excess. There is no sort of normal excess pressure because it would depend on what is your catheter, the size, the length, the position, the hemodynamics of the patient, the pressures in the thoracic or the abdominal compartments, what is the blood flow you're asking. But in general, if your excess pressure is minus 200 or more and you're all you're unable to sustain uh, the desired blood flow that would be indicative of uh, a, a catheter dysfunction or a extremely negative excess pressure generally in pra clinical practice for blood flows of about 100 to 150 to 200 excess pressure swing around minus 60 to about a minus 100 very rarely they will hit uh, uh, triple digits if they if you have a good functioning excess and um, a negative excess pressure alarm just tells you that you are unable to achieve your desired flow. It is also important to remember that when you're connecting it to the ECMO machine, the excess pressure becomes a positive pressure. And before you connect the machine to the ECMO, you need to um, kind of uh, change it into the software to, 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 uh, uh, to, to tell the machine that you're going to do that, otherwise you will be alarming. The effluent pressure is the pressure measured in the effluent compartment and the major determinants are the membrane pore permeability, uh, what is your CKRT modality, if you're using a convective modality after a, a certain period of usage, after there's a formation of secondary membrane, the effluent pressure is going to slowly transform from a positive pressure to maybe a negative pressure. The effluent pressure may remain positive if your therapy is predominantly a diffusive therapy because there's dialysate flowing in the effluent compartment, there's very little convection happening. And this pressure again kind of gives us an idea of where we are in terms of our filter membrane performance. The transmembrane pressure is the difference in the pressure between the blood side and the dialysate or the ultrafiltrate side of the membrane. And it represents what is happening across the pores of the filters. And the major determinants again here are what is the blood flow rate, what is the modality of dialysis you're using, uh, what is the surface area of the filter for required blood flow rates, the efferent flow rate, etc. And usually uh, increasing transmembrane pressure over a period and when it's going beyond 200 or 250, it suggests that the, the pores are essentially all clogged and to, to generate the desired amount of convective flow, uh, it is going to be very, very difficult. And of course, it's, a, it's also a possibility that some of the fibers may have been clotting and therefore the effective surface area that is available in the filter to, to deliver the, the blood flow rate and to deliver the dose is essentially reduced. 
The filter pressure drop, like I mentioned earlier, represents what happens uh, uh, the, uh, from between the, the fibers from the arterial end to the to the to the venous end. And as the filter fibers are clotting, there is a progressive uh, rise in this pressure. And the analogy I generally give to to my uh, juniors or residents who want to learn something about CRTs, I treat it as a dam. If you have a river flowing and there is no obstruction in between, the pressure at point A and point B are going to be almost the same. But if you build increasing uh, resistance in this flow, or if you build a dam, the upstream pressure is going to be very high and the downstream pressure is going to be low or remain the same. And therefore, the differential of this pressure between upstream and downstream is going to increase. So a rising filter pressure drop is basically telling us that progressively more fibers are getting clotted and therefore the upstream pressure is going high. Now, so, so this is just again a pictorial representation. The transmembrane pressure is telling us more about the clogging, the, the secondary membrane formation uh, uh, visual that uh, Dr. Marlies had shared with you earlier. And the filter pressure drop tells us more about clotting. So when, when in, in, in our unit, we use the, the data that we collect to kind of draw pressure graphs. And when this filter is clotting, it is important or it, is, it, it pays sometimes to go and look back at these graphs because it tells you possibly what was the mechanism of filter clotting. So this is a very typical graph of a clogging filter where there is a progressive negative effluent pressure, positive transmembrane pressure, but you see the filter pressure drop almost remains the same. So when this is a filter that, like was pointed earlier, the, the anticoagulation may not change filter life very much. But what I would want to change for this filter to try and see whether I can make the next one uh, last longer would be to change the modality. So if I'm doing a very high convective dose, I may want to consider to shifting some of this convective dose to a diffusive dose and then see whether I can influence these pressures. This, of course, is like a clotting filter where there you see a steep rise in the effluent pressure, in the transmembrane pressure and the filter pressure drop. And if I have repeated clotting filters, this is a type where I will want to go back and look at my vascular access, look at my anticoagulation strategy, look at my filtration fraction. I want to review my prescription before continuing the next filter. Then, of course, there would be filters that, that have both things working together. And in fact, the pattern of this pressure uh, monitoring has been studied to try and predict the mechanisms of filter failure uh, in this study and which would be different from a clotting filter or a vascular access problem or a coagulation problem. Now, in the last few minutes, we will talk to connection with other therapies and the, the most common one that we would require to do would be in our medical or cardiothoracic units where we would have patients who are on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation and they require CKRT. And sometimes CKRT in these patients is required also to help uh, resolve or manage fluid balance in, this, in these patients. And because we know fluid balance in this group is again associated with poor outcomes. So before we, be, before we look uh, into the connectology, uh, sorry, did I go back? So, so before we look into the connectology, the, there are two major ways of connecting it. A parallel system approach wherein you run these two therapies separate from, this, from each other. And the other one is where we can integrate our CKRT circuit into the ECMO circuit. Now, before we go on to the integration, I just a, a brief overview of an ECMO. So generally for an ECMO, I would, I would divide it into a few segments. It's the first segment is the pre-pump segment, which is generally preload dependent. And this is a segment before the centrifugal ECMO pump, where the pressure is a very negative pressure. And this negative pressure, because the cannula bore diameters are, are very large, they are generally about minus 80 plus, uh, thereabouts in, for, for for uh, ECMO flows of a few liters, or three to five liters a minute. After the pump, all the pressure downstream to the ECMO pump is a positive pressure segment. And the segment between the pump and the membrane uh, is the post-pump segment, which is generally very afterload sensitive. And the pressure here is are probably the highest in the ECMO circuit, about plus 200 to about plus 400 millimeters uh, in, 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 in range. 
Now, as the blood then perfuses the membrane, there is a slight pressure drop across the membrane because of the resistance that it offers to the blood flow. And the, the, the delta pressure across the membrane is around 40 odd millimeters of mercury reflecting the drop in the pressure. And then, of course, is, is, the, is the return cannula downstream to the membrane uh, into the uh, aorta or the vein, depending on what was the indication for ECMO. So this was again um, an article from uh, Dr. Osterman where various uh, uh, possible combinations have been described. So the parallel combination, we have two separate accesses for the CRT machine and for the ECMO machine. And in the integrated system, we could we have various choices of integrating our CKRT access and the CKRT return. In general, there are two combinations of that are more commonly used or preferred is when we take the CKRT access and return the access between the pump and the membrane, which has the highest positive pressure segment uh, in, in the whole circuit to, to minimize the risk of air embolism. And with, with the newer ones, we are able to probably connect, uh, take the vascular access from the post-membrane uh, post segment and do a return pre-ECMO membrane. Now, usually in all connections, a general rule is your return from the CRT machine into the ECMO circuit should always be pre-membrane to, to minimize a, a risk of air embolism. The other thing, and this is a very good graph I managed to capture, this was a patient who was receiving CKRT via an access and then had to be, and that access had to be removed and we had to integrate this into a CKRT uh, circuit and you can immediately see how the, the pressures change from a negative access pressure to a very positive access pressure. And similarly, the effluent pressures went from negative to positive uh, and, and, and because we move from a, a, a low flow uh, system to a very high flow, high pressure system. And so sometimes people, uh, when they, 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 they do integrate, they have studies that have shown that CKRT on ECMO has statistically significant higher blood flow rates and more efficient effluent delivery and lesser heparin use uh, when they were able to adjust their, their, their connections to, to deliver the appropriate CKRT. So this is just a few examples of a few connections that we have used in our unit when we use the, the various uh, ECMO membranes that are available and the corresponding pressures that you would see. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is again where we essentially take from the, the post-oxygenator and uh, return it before the oxygenator membrane. Uh, sometimes we do run into problems with, with pressure because the pressure readings may be very high or very low and there have been studies where they have used uh, intermittent uh, say three-way uh, 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 stop cocks etc to, to kind of dampen the pressure effect uh, and uh, they have shown that with this they were able to successfully continue CKRT integration into the ECMO machine. At our unit we have have come back, we have actually made a Y connector wherein we split the ECMO access um, or, or the ECMO return into a pre-pump segment and a post-pump segment to kind of offset some of the very high positive pressures that, that we may get. Um, Sometimes we have patients who are on LVAD and RVAD and there is a possibility of connecting that. I personally do not have experience with RVAD, but there is, it is out in the literature. The other common therapies that we connect in, in, or we need to connect and which we do in our unit is when sometimes we need to run plasma exchange and CKRT concurrently. For example, we had a thyroid storm who crashed, who required an ECMO, CRRT, and plasma exchange uh, to, to help manage the, the, the thyroid storm. So we have two different connections that we have designed for centrifugal plasma machine wherein we do not need very high blood flow rates and we do need and obligate anticoagulation. So there we do a parallel connection where we put in a Y connector at both the access and the return side and from the very outset we kind of split the blood flow into two streams, one to the CRT machine and one to the uh, 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 to the return uh, to the dialysis machine. Of course, the downsize is that uh, the anticoagulation strategy has to be different, and our CRT access has to have good integrity to support this blood flow rate. 
Sometimes, and which in our renal unit, we do membrane separation blaze plus plasma pheresis, and then we have developed this connectology wherein we connect two Y connectors to the return line between the return line and the return blue access port. And as the blood is returning from the CKRT, we siphon off a certain volume of blood into our plasma exchange machine and then we do the plasma exchange and then this blood is returned into the circuit before it enters into the patient. Again, the, the, the requirement, the advantage here is I can get away with one circuit, one blood flow and one anticoagulation strategy uh, in this. But of course, I have to be careful of the blood, blood flow rates I set for the plasma exchange, which has to be definitely less than that of the plasma filter. If I have 30 seconds more, I, just a couple more. Uh, the, the other one which is, which is now increasingly used and, and I suspect may find more use is uh, the extracorporeal CO2 removal, uh, which can be done independently of CKRT or integrated with the CKRT circuit. And most, um, many of these modern machines or platforms allow for these multiple therapies to happen together. And uh, lastly, again, what we use is uh, hemoperfusion columns uh, when we are treating patients with sepsis or in post-cardiac surgery situations or hyperinflammatory states or uh, 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 situations where, where you have a high cytokine release, etc., where again, these cartridges can be integrated into the CKRT machine. So with that, I will stop here. Thank you very much.